Okay, so now let's talk about the simplex method. So this is not really easy, so we need to、um, be, be patient and be careful. Okay, let's start. So all we need to know is that we want to search among basic feasible solutions, right? So graphically or geometrically, that means we want to search among extreme points. So we move along those edges. And、uh, algebraically, that means we want to replace variables one by one to move to adjacent basic feasible solutions. So it would be nice if you can merit this kind of setting, okay? From a geometrically defined concept, we now use an algebraically defined concept so that computers can really help us. Okay, so now we actually have several questions. If we have a point, we want to move along edge. We need to know which edge to move along. And once we want to move along a direction, we need to know when to stop. And basically, that means we want to find the right way to go and do not become invisible. And all this must be done with algebra instead of geometry. Okay? If you draw a graph, everything is easy. But we now want to solve a problem with thousands of variables and constraints, so we need to use algebra. Algebraically, we want to replace one basic variable by a non-basic one. For example, if today I tell you that we want to move from B one to somewhere else, then we have several options. If B one has three basic variables, that means we want to remove one. For example, remove x one. And replace x one by another currently non-basic variable. So that means we want to do two things. We want to select one non-basic variable to enter the basis, and we want to select one basic variable to leave the basis. Once we select these two variables, then we replace them or we switch the role of them. Then we are pretty much done. So regarding entering and leaving, selecting one non-basic variable to enter a basis typically means to make it non-zero. Why is that? Because typically, when we want to select a variable, a non-basic variable is zero, right? We call our definition of basic solutions. Non-basic variables are zero, and the basic variables are the result of a b x c b equals zero. Ah,、uh, a equals b. So that means we want to increase its value from zero to a positive value, and then at that moment it becomes basic. So that means entering a non-basic variable, making it become basic, and then with that variable increases. We should identify basic variables that will decrease, and make sure that they do not become non-negative, because variables all should be non-negative. So once a basic variable hits zero, we stop, and then we say that particular basic variable leaves the basis, and it becomes non-basic. That's how we do a switch. That's how we do a switch. We keep changing the basis until we find an optimal basis, which means we have nowhere to improve. Then now let's see how to do this in algebra. Suppose we have this particular example. Okay, maximize two x one plus three x two, subject to x one plus two x two less than or equal to six, and two x one plus x two less than or equal to eight, and the both variables should be non-negative. You may draw a graph to see the solution, but now we want to use the pure algebra. First, let's convert it to a standard form. So we add x three and x four to make them equality, simple. And now we have four variables. And now we need to keep track of the objective value because each time we want to improve our solution, we don't want to do something useless. So We want to give two x one plus three x two on the objective value a special name. We call it z, or we use z to denote that objective value to make our、um, explanation and the de derivation derivations easier. So the objective value will sometimes just be called the z value, 
uh, when we call the z value in object uh, operations research, typically we are talking about the objective value. And then once we keep in mind that we are maximizing z, and all the variables except z must be non-negative, we may actually replace that objective function by another equality constraint like this. Okay? We're going to say that z minus 2x1 minus 3x2 should be 0. And that's exactly our definition, right? Then we expand our 2 by 4 system to a 3 by 5 system. And then for every solution that can satisfy the 2 by 4 system, which means that is a feasible solution, we have a corresponding value z, which would be our um, objective value. That's the idea. So now we don't have the objective function. It is implicitly represented as a constraint. We're going to call this the zeros constraint, so that this is the first one, this is the second one, and then starting from now, we will only need to worry about solving linear systems. Okay, so to start, we need to have an initial basic feasible solution, right? Because we want to move among basic feasible solutions. So we need to have a one first. So that means we need to select two columns to say they are basic, and then blah, blah, blah. Here, we are lucky, because we can say x3 and x4 are basic. Once we do that, we know we need to remove x1 and x2, and then we want to solve a linear system x3 equals 6 and x4 equals 8, and then the solution is immediately there. We say we are lucky because here, this guy is an identity matrix, right? So that means we can immediately get an answer, and that there is definitely a solution. If we choose, a, uh, we choose two columns that are not an identity matrix, then first we need to really solve the system to check whether all the variables are non-basic, uh, sorry, are non-negative. And second, if unfortunately there is a variable that is negative, we need to choose another set of columns, and we have no idea when to stop. So, if we see an identity matrix, of course, we set it as the initial basics, and then we have the initial basic feasible solution. Okay, so our initial basic feasible solution would have, of course, four variables. 0, 0, non-basic, and 6 and 8, basic. And the 6 and 8 are here. 0, 0 are here. So your z at this moment is 0. <coughs> now, let's choose a non-basic variable to enter. Because we want to move. Move means replace a non-basic, uh, replace a basic variable by a non-basic one. So we want to select either x1 or x2 to enter. Because currently they are non-basic. If we are asking ourselves, which variable should we choose? Then we probably want to look at the zeros row. Here, x1 and x2 are both zero. If we want to increase, for example, x1, obviously x2 should be the same, equaling zero at that moment, because we want to enter only one variable. And then when x1 goes up, z should always goes up because of this negative coefficient. So that means it's good. If we enter x1, that's going to help us. If we enter x2, that's also helping us. So for no reason, let's assume I want to choose x1 to enter. Okay, so x1 may become 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. Whenever we increase x1 by 1 unit, we would improve our objective value by 2 units because this number is negative 2. But we know sometime we need to stop. Because when x1 goes up, your x3 and x4 would go down so that these equalities are still satisfied. So when x1 becomes 1, becomes 2, becomes 3, your x3 and x4 goes down and down, and eventually we need to stop at 4020. Because at that moment, 
your x1 becomes 4 and your x4 becomes 0. If you increase x1 further, your x4 would become negative, which is not allowed. So you stop here. This actually tells us that we are actually doing some kind of ratio calculation. Okay? When we increase x1, we know x3 and x4 are forced to become smaller. Which one will hit 0 first depends on 6 divided by 1 and 8 divided by 2. Depends on which ratio is smaller. When that ratio is smaller, that particular corresponding variable would hit 0 first. Immediately you see, oh, indeed, that's x4. Okay, so far so good. And we may move to another solution, 4020. If you plug in 4020, your z would be 8. That's the second basic feasible solution, which is indeed better than the previous one. Good. And then, if we want to keep improving our current solution, we need to try to move to the next basic feasible solution. So now, because x2 and x4 are non-basic variables, we may try to enter either one. So I haven't told you how to choose, but let's assume I want to enter x2. When I want to enter x2, that may create some problems now. What's that? When x2 goes up, we know at the same time x4 should remain 0, because we only want to enter one variable. And then the second row here, okay, this one, <coughs> tells us that when x2 goes up and x4 remains 0, x2 can be at most 8, so that at that moment x1 becomes 0. Okay, that's from second row. It's okay. But in the first row, it's a little bit harder because when x2 goes up, you see x1 and x3 both existing in row 1. So you have no idea how x1 and x3 will change, right? You need to be careful here. You need to remind yourself that, oh, you still have constraint 2. And according to constraint 2, when your x2 goes up by one unit, your x1 should decrease by one half unit, okay, by looking at here. So that means in row 1, if x2 goes up by one unit, then it is forced by, x, by constraint 2 that your x1 must go down by one half. And then all together, you see your x3 must go down by 3 over 2. So you need to do this kind of two-step calculations to convince yourself that your x3 will change in this way. And then that allows you to find that x2 can be at most 4 over 3, according to constraint 1. And then we know, okay, if we keep doing that in one iteration, then in the next step, we will move to this particular solution. And that just means, oh, we, when we are doing the calculations, we are comparing 8 and 4 over 3, okay? Constraint 2 tells us that, at most, x2 can be 8. Constraint 1 tells us that, at most, x2 can be 4 over 3. That's why we stop at 4 over 3. And then we may calculate the z value. The z value here requires us to in enter both variables x1 and x2 into the objective value. Again, this is also somewhat um, weird. Because previously we have z2, okay? Previously we have z2, which is 8. But when x2 goes up by this amount, we cannot just add that particular amount into z. That's not right. Because when x2 increases, x1 would decrease at the same time. So your z value must be calculated by considering all those changing variables. When you only have two constraints and two variables, all the things happening here uh, can be handled. But if you really have thousands of variables and constraints, that would be terrible. So there must be some other ways that is more systematic 
and it can be run uh, automatically. Okay, so <coughs> just a reminder, we had two flows in what we did in the previous page. First is about constraints. When we increase the non-basic variable x2, it may affect both variables, both basic variables x1 and x3. And in general, it may affect all those basic variables. Because a basic variable does not appear in constraint 2, so constraint 2 is easy. It tells us how x1 would respond to x2. But for other constraints, it would be hard. And in general, if you have too many constraints and too many variables, that's too hard. For the objective function, it's the similar thing. When we increase the non-basic variable x2, it's going to affect several other basic variables. And many of those basic variables would have coefficients in the objective function. So we need to calculate the objective function from the scratch by inputting all the variables. So how may we do these calculations in an easiest way so that with thousands of variables and constraints we can still handle it? Well, that's some elegant um, design of the simplex method to be introduced in the next video. Thank you.